are a peaceful people struggling, we struggle. And we don't look for trouble, just ask around. But when outside faces from foreign places talk about taking over, we ain't backing down. No, we ain't giving up no mountain. No, we ain't giving up no tree. We ain't giving up no river that belongs to me. Not the one blue sake. Not one rice grain, not one grass, not a blade of grass. This land is our land now. We're gonna make it somehow. We will bend like a bow, but never break. Our fathers came here. And they lived and died here And we are moving from here Make no mistake No, we ain't giving up no mountain No, we ain't giving up no tree We ain't giving up no river That belong to we Not one blue sake Not one rice grain Not one for us Not a blade of grass Of the open country of the Rupanuni and the Essequibo, the time or night. Though we'll be criticize it, this is our home, we love it, and we mean to keep it, we have that right. Though we ain't giving up no mountain, we ain't giving up no tree, we ain't giving up no river that belong to me, not one blue sake. Not one rice grain, not one for us, not a blade of grass, not one golden apple, not one jamon, not a drop of water from the former room, not one cherry The Archipelagic and Island States Forum is a platform designed to facilitate 47 archipelagic and island nations to collaborate and cooperate in addressing common challenges in four thematic areas, climate change mitigation and adaptation, blue economy, marine plastic debris, and good maritime governance. In 2017, the idea to establish the multinational cooperation framework among the archipelagic and island states was first iterated during the UN Ocean Conference in New York. In November 2018, Indonesia hosted the first ministerial meeting with 27 archipelagic and island states. The Archipelagic and Island States Forum was established by Manando Joint Declaration. In the following year, the second ministerial meeting adopted the final outcome with 25 AIS participating countries. To achieve our vision, we focus on four objectives which we translate into our programs. Create an open, innovative, and engaging forum. Provide a space to share and implement innovative and tangible programs. Promote collaborative efforts among stakeholders. And create opportunity through the blue economy. Ideation, implementation, and evaluation are the core elements to our solution framework in addressing the problems. In 2020, AIS Forum launched programs to drive innovation which are AIS Joint Research, a collaborative applied research program affiliated with academic institution in AIS countries with various topics related to the four areas of collaboration. The Innovator Scholarship Program, a fully funded exchange program for talented individuals from AIS participating countries who can demonstrate exceptional leadership quality and creative mind and AIS Innovation Challenge. 
to find innovative ideas and breakthroughs that can help societies and businesses to be more resilient and adaptive during crisis situations. AIS Forum also launched AIS Blue Startup Hub, a platform to connect marine-focused startup in 47 archipelagic and island states across the globe. AIS Blue Startup Hub Mentoring Program was launched with 18 participating startups from six countries. As an effort to realize the smart, innovative solutions, AIS Forum also engaged with public audiences through online events in a form of trainings, workshops, talk shows, and discussions with various topics and stakeholders across AIS participating countries. In light of COVID-19 pandemic, it is important for archipelagic and island states to have a resilient economy. Therefore, AIS Forum Secretariat introduces programs which focuses on blue economy. As a form of its commitment, AIS Forum developed Blue Economy Development Index, or BEDI. This index will be used as a tracking tool to determine the current use of coastal and marine resources and it can be used as a tool to meet the Sustainable Development Goals. Blue Financing Framework, or BFF, which provides a guidance for governments, financial institutions, philanthropists, and donors to align their investments with the Blue Economy principles and allow them to select a project to be financed in the Blue Economy sectors. Smart and innovative solution programs, such as sharing knowledge sessions with experts and representatives from AIS participating countries. Plankton, which was a competition to raise awareness in reducing marine plastic debris. Impact pitching, which connects startups, small and medium-sized enterprises, potential investors, and growth enablers to gain partnership. And Ending Plastic Pollution Innovation Challenge, which was a collaboration with Marine Plastic Debris Project from UNDP Indonesia to address marine plastic pollution in Southeast Asia. Many solutions to challenges that affect AIS participating countries in four main thematic areas and SDG 14 goals are produced through collaboration programs. These programs will explore opportunities through innovation and experiment that benefits on a local, regional, and international scale through sharing knowledge and experiences between AIS participating countries. Good morning, everyone. Good morning from Guyana. Good evening over there in Indonesia. And it is good afternoon in United, United Kingdom. And I want to sincerely welcome you all to this webinar, the first of it of among these uh, many series. Coastal and marine areas are extraordinarily dynamic, diverse, unique, and complex because these are multifunctional environments. Coastal and marine area activities, they are growing in number and in size. So as a consequence, practitioners, managers, and researchers, they are calling for assessment and management to address diverse and the multifunctionalities that are presented by this environment, all the hazards that this environment may be exposed to. The discussion that we are having today is not only timely, but it is also equally essential and important. The, the Scholar Space series aim to strengthen relationship between the AIS participating countries and form the linkages in the growing AIS university network, as well as enhance students, managers and researchers' ability to understand core issues affecting the coastal and marine management. With this snapshot, I want to sincerely welcome you to this first scholar space with AIS. And I want to thank AIS, UNDP, the University of Guyana, especially our Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Baino, and uh, our panelists for agreeing to be on this platform. 
And I want to sincerely also appreciate all people who have registered and some of us that have come up on stream uh, to be part of this um, webinar and panel discussion. Without, more ad without much ado, uh, I have, we, have a, we are privileged to have a vice chancellor here to do the welcoming and do the uh, opening remarks. Just to quickly, to summarily introduce our vice chancellor. Our vice chancellor is Professor Paloma Mohamed, who is currently and is the 11th vice chancellor of the University of Guyana. The most youthful and the first woman to ever hold the post in the university's 57 year history. And equally important, the first female vice chancellor in this Ganglo uh, Caribbean, South Africa, South America axis. She's highly, a highly decorated scholar and artist. She's a very much sought after strategist and change specialist, having done a PhD and specializing in these areas. Professor Paloma Mohamed Martin is a highly successful fundraiser and academic, having widely published on various areas related to the arts, social, and behavioral sciences. Professor Mohamed has led an extensive international life and is a beloved teacher, a notable researcher, and she has been variously referred to as a servant leader, a visionary, and a titanium butterfly. She has won many awards, not only at the local level, even at the international realm. In 2014, she was named by the US government as one of the top five most influential women in Guyana. And in, the same, in that same year, became the first and the holy woman, woman to hold the highly coveted Anthony S. Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence in Hearts and Letter, which is considered the Nobel Prize of the Caribbean. Caribbean. She's also the recipient of two presidential awards and a City of New York Award, award among others. Most importantly, our vice chancellor has been supportive of our faculty in many ways. And it's a great privilege and honor for me to welcome a VC to do the welcoming and opening remarks. Vice Chancellor, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Temi Topi, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. Please remind me to ask my secretary to give you uh, the short bio next time. <laughs> So that the bio will not be longer than my remarks. But ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm delighted to join you from Georgetown, Guyana, and to recognize the first and foremost, the wonderful work of our own faculty at the University of Guyana. So chairperson, moderator, uh, dean of the faculty of Earth and Environmental Sciences, uh, Dr. Temitope Oyetun. Uh, Dr. Paulette Bino, newly appointed Deputy Dean in the School for Graduate Studies, but our own international, internationally renowned scholar uh, in climate change. Uh, Mr. Philip De Silva, former DVC, so DVC em Emeritus um, from the Burbies campus. Uh, Ms. Linda uh, Johnson, Linda Johnson, Bola Johnson from the Faculty of um, Environmental Earth and Environmental Sciences. Uh, they just changed their name a little while ago, so I'm thinking of their older name. And uh, of course, uh, to our distinguished uh, guest speaker today, um, Dr. Buckingham from the University College of London. We do have another uh, engagement with University College of London, so I'm happy to see that we're engaging with another part of the university. A wonderful persons who have joined us online and in the conference. And of course, I'd like to ac acknowledge the work of Levita who has been uh, working with my office to keep me informed about this. I am delighted on behalf of the university to bring you welcome uh, remarks this morning, literally just to say welcome, but to kind of contextualize in the context of what we are doing at the University of Guyana and what we are facing as a nation, as a region right now, and I guess as a, as a world, um, in terms of, of climate change. Before I go further, I'd like to uh, extend the university's uh, uh, deepest commiserations 
to our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent and Barbados and those Caribbean islands which have been affected by the volcano. And of course, everyone knows that uh, the, the Guyana is in a very special place with regard to our sea levels. We're below sea level. And therefore this idea of coastal uh, work studies, uh, coastal management is very, very important and dear to us. Anytime uh, something happens with sea level rising, um, with uh, ecology, marine ecology, um, with environment, um, especially with regard to the coast, it is of sig tremendous significance to Guyana, but more significant to the University of Guyana. And why is this? It is so because we are about a half a mile from the Atlantic Ocean. There are not many people in the world who get to drive along the Atlantic Ocean every morning to get to work and to go home. So we're very lucky in that regard. But we're also uh, always uh, facing the very significant uh, risk on, on a daily basis, even though it has become very easy for us to forget about it, that we are so, so far below sea level and that any sea level rise or any um, uh, any event that is marine that is, that causes, uh, you know, kind of rising sea levels, even even temporarily, um, would threaten uh, our university very quickly, and of course our coast where most of our people live. As I looked at your uh, terms of reference, which I was looking at yesterday and this morning, I noted that there are a couple of four major areas um, for cooperation between uh, the, um, the Ar Ar archipelag archipelic island states. That's a really interesting, that's a mouthful to say, <laughs> a, a group, the forum. And these um, are climate change mitigation and adaptation, disaster management, the blue economy, marine plastic debris, and good maritime governance. And we, uh, about uh, two years ago in 2019, the University of Guyana started to work on the design for the future. What is the University of 2040 for the U University of Guyana going to be? And we call that document our Blueprint 2040. And in that blueprint, we have four aspirational goals. And one of those aspirational goals, I think goal number two, is to be a center of excellence in eight specific uh, domains. And at the top of that list is um, aqua and agriculture, and then of course, climate, um, climate change and environmental um, studies, given that FEES had already put Guyana on the map and is, is leading blazing a trail worldwide in this area. But also the fact that uh, in successive governments over the last 30 years, it doesn't matter what they call their programs, there's always been at the core of their, their, their significant national policy, this idea that Guyana was an environmentally responsible state. So whether it was a green state, it was a low carbon development state, um, this idea has held firmly across, the, across uh, um, administrations. And I think that all Guyanese have internalized ourselves as environmentally responsible. And so um, we believe that both geophysically um, and geologically, Guyana is important to the, the well being of the planet. And therefore, your work in this area um, and the things that you're going to discuss today are not only of germane importance to us directly as a university and as a country, but our region and to the planet. I therefore want to thank you and everyone who has joined this morning um, for your work, for your continued work, for what you're gonna do. And I sincerely look forward to listening to the rest of the morning's proceedings. I know you have some of the best of the best from UG on the panel and uh, from London as well. And so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. God bless you. And may you all continue to be safe as we navigate this very interesting, perilous, but opportunistic time for scholars and for the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, VC. Um, that's, I know our Vice Chancellor always delivers. So thank you so much, uh, VC, for the welcoming and the opening remarks. Um, moving on on our agenda, I, I would like to use this opportunity to also welcome Mr. Ahmad as your son to, to come and um, give a remarks about AIS. Currently, he is the, he is the head of AIS, AIS Forum Secretariat, which uh, he joined in, the, in March 2020. 
And Mr. Ahmad, Sonny has experience in multiple sectors, including energy, technology, and public sector, where he has served as an advisor at the Presidential Executive Office in Indonesia. He graduated with a Master's of Public Administration in Energy Management and Policy uh, from Columbia University. And he has more than 10 years of professional experience in multiple sectors, such as energy, government, technology, international affairs, and he has experience in mobilizing resources uh, and managing pro projects. So colleagues and uh, our participants, please join me in welcoming Mr. Ahmed Sonny to uh, give us some updates from about AIS. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ray Dutton. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Baino, Dr. Aydatun, other honorable colleagues, um, on behalf of the AS Forum, I would like to thank all of you uh, for willing to host this wonder wonderful event. Um, so this scholar space is a platform uh, that we create uh, to facilitate ac academic communities uh, to share their knowledge, ideas, and innovation with the public. So uh, just a few days ago, we held our uh, other scholar space with the University of Malta, and we're excited uh, to be able to bring some of the best minds uh, around that region to sit together and discuss some of the common challenges that we as an island country are dealing with uh, right now. And today uh, we are grateful uh, and honored to partner with the University of Guyana as uh, our host for uh, the scholar space for the Caribbean region. And, we hope we can also bring some of the best minds from this region to collaborate with each other and also address the specific issues that this region may have. So our, topics, uh, our topic for today is the innovative approach to coastal and marine management. And it is an issue that is central and important to the AIS forum. And just to highlight what the vice chancellor has just mentioned about the issue of sea level rise, it is something that becomes the major concern of our colleagues from the Pacific as well. And one that we continue to work together uh, under the AIS forum uh, with that region. Uh, and, and just to mention one particular uh, study that we are currently doing is uh, the impact of sea level, sea level rise on sovereignty boundary. So as you can see, the AIS forum is a platform uh, to facilitate all archipelagic and island states regardless of their size and level of economic development. So we focus uh, more on technical cooperations around three main areas. The first one is R&D, uh, the second one is entrepreneurship and international collaboration. And I'm happy to announce that uh, we will support the research initiative led by Dr. Oydaton from the University of Guyana and Dr. Helena Burningham from the University of College London um, and hopefully you will be able to support more R&D initiatives uh, coming, coming from uh, this uh, very wonderful region. And in addition to R&D, uh, we also have other university related program uh, and that is the Innovator Scholarship, uh, which is essentially a student exchange scholarship. And I just want to take this opportunity to invite all bachelor and master students uh, from the University of Guyana and other universities from the region as well to apply for this program. Um, uh, and you can just check our website for more, more details about this program and uh, our other programs. I think that's just a brief summary about the AIS forum. Uh, and finally, I want to thank again, the University of Guyana for their, their kind support. Uh, and hopefully this is, will be the start of our uh, collaboration in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hackmaid, and uh, um, we are very, very grateful for your interest and uh, for what AIS is doing. Uh, moving on, on our agenda for today, we, we will hear from the, uh, the two keynote speakers from our um, uh, university, from our faculty here. Um, I, I would like to start with Mr. Philip Da Silva. And um, as you get ready and uh, to deliver the first keynote for the next um, uh, 10 minutes, Mr. Da Silva is a reader in the Division of Natural Sciences and he has been an educator for more than 30 years. 
His experience also includes him working as a consultant in the field of environmental management. He has studied at the University of Guyana and the University of West Indies, where he has completed undergraduate and graduate programs in biology, ed biology education, environmental science, and marine resource and environmental management. Over the years, as you heard from my vice chancellor, he has served the University of Guyana in various capacities and as deputy, at one time as deputy vice chancellor. As, as assistant director of the University of Guyana by this campus, he has served as dean and assistant dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences. He has served also as head of the Department of Biology and manager of the Center for the Study of Biological Diversity. He teaches courses in biology, ecology, botany, biochemistry, coastal zone management, environmental science, education, environmental management, environmental conservation, and several fields, several related fields. He has researched and published in the fields in which he has taught. And his research interests include conservation biology, natural, natural resource management, tourism, integrated coastal zone management, mangrove ecology, conservation and management and education for sustainable development. He has also served public and community in many ways, including him serving as the chief examiner and moderator for the regional CXC Cape Environmental Science Examination. He has also served as chairperson and member of the National Wildlife Scientific Committee and the Guyana Wildlife Conservation and Management Commission. Mr. Da Silva is the recipient of a national award, the Golden Arrow of Achievement, for his many years of dedicated service to Guyana and the field of education. And most importantly, is one of the lecturers that teaches in the Faculty of Health and Environmental Sciences, especially on our Masters of Environmental Management program. Colleagues, the panelists and the attendees, please join me in welcoming Mr. Philip Da Silva to this virtual platform to deliver the first keynote address. Good morning, Over everyone. Thank you very much, Dean, and good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you. I, with such a good introduction, I do hope that I can do justice to the presentation that I have in front of me. I will first of all share with you the outline of the presentation I will um, give. I will just give an overview of Guyana's coastal zone. A little bit on coastal zone management in Guyana, looking at the context, the issues and the challenges. And then I will touch on the innovative approach, mangroves, which I uh, would want to make the center of what I'm going to present today, looking at some of the lessons, the challenges, and some of the outcomes. And again, looking ahead. First, I would say that the pictures, the images that I will use in this presentation, I don't own them, nor do I claim ownership. I would have taken some of them, some of them from the Mangrove Restoration Program website and some of them from the public domain. So I hope, wish no one to sue me, so I put that out there. Good. Now, integrated coastal zone management in Guyana has been and has always been thought about being about managing people, managing infrastructure, and ecosystems and activities within a coastal space, all in the effort to achieve coastal resilience. Now, when one speaks about the coastal zone, globally, we all can recognize that coastal zones are important. They're unique areas, and they do hold quite a bit of the world's population. In Guyana, that is no different. About 7% of the total land area is within the coastal zone. 90% of our population is there. Our economic activities and our administrative activities are concentrated there. We are extremely vulnerable, as we heard earlier. Uh, Mr. Impact Philip, of uh, sorry, just a minute. Yes. I, I think you want to share your screen. Do you want to share your presentation? Yes, I attempted to do so. Please. I? Um, Let me try. It probably did not go through. Sorry. Okay. Okay, sorry for cutting you short, okay? No, that's okay. I'll do it all okay. over again. Yes, the presentation yes. is coming up now. It's coming up there now? Yes, I can see. Thank you. Okay, 
good. All right. And I should then, let me try to get it open. Good, okay. So, I, and I did, I was about to say that the protection of the coast is, um, the protection is given either by man-made defenses or by natural defenses. And among those natural defenses, we have our mangroves. So when we think about, and again, it's uh, about the concerns about Guyana's coastal zone, one of my key concerns that I would point out is the fact that it's low-lying. And the fact that it's low-lying also points to the fact that it is indeed going to have an imminent threat from the rising sea level due to climate change and ultimately is going to experience some amount of flooding. The, the good thing about it is that the flooding can be either from the terrestrial end, when we think of the drainage and irrigation systems that we have, or when we think of the coastal impact and the marine impact from the marine environment. There are other issues that I can elaborate on, but that one is one that I think I would want to um, use. In terms of the constraints that will hinder the effectiveness of the integrated coastal zone management efforts to address the pressures and challenges that Guyana experiences, there are three out of the many that I have listed here that I would want to just highlight. One would be the lack of the delineation of the coastal zone, the challenges that we have with maintaining the sea defense infrastructure, and the somewhat limited to inactive ICZM um, coastal zone management program. And I would identify those three because to me they are very important and they will relate directly to what I will speak about shortly. Now, the big question one would ask is why mangroves? Now, we recognize that the mangroves play an important role. They are habit good habitats. We recognize that they also give us or offer some amount of protection to the coast. And we also recognize the threat as it says here, the recognition of the threats and increased risks to Guyana's low coastal plain posed by predicted rises in sea level and the rising cost of maintenance of our sea defense structures. Hence came the mangrove restoration program. Now the, rest, the mangrove restoration program, I must point out, started out as a project in 2010 and for three years, the National Agriculture Research and Extension Institute, NARI as we call it, ran this project. It was a funded project by the government of Guyana and the European Union. And this project had quite a bit of success. So much so that the recognition of the importance of mangroves to Guyana's coastal protection saw this project being incorporated fully into the activities of NARI as one of its ongoing programs or annual programs. And I must say now that this program forms a key part of the Guy of Guyana's approach to cost-effective natural sea defense and climate change mitigation measure for coastal protection. The program did have some successes. It helped raise the awareness of mangroves and their importance increased local output in terms of research on mangroves, education and awareness, production of materials for schools, the mangrove action plan was updated, and we saw quite a bit of innovative restoration innovations being implemented. And it is out of those innovations that I think the real and the true value and role of mangroves in coastal management, in marine management, and in coastal protection is recognized and is what I'm going to try to speak for today. Some of these interventions that we have, we would have had um, mangrove seed, seedling planting, innovative engineering structures, the use of spartina grass, restrictive gates and fences, and some rubble mound groins. Now, Guyana has at least three well known species of mangroves the Avicenia germinans 
the Lagunquilier racemosa, and the Rhizophora. Now, of these three main species, the Avicenna germinans is the one that is found on the coast and the one that basically can withstand the coastal dynamics and the coastal pressures and all that it has to endure. In the search for a sustainable and ecosystem friendly initiative, they had to then come up with some form of engineering designs and engineering structures. And among those, the geotextile tubing in the form of groins, the bamboo brushwood dams, and the rubble mounds, they all were used and they served to positively impact the sediment cycle and the sediment budget to ultimately increase the elevation so that it will make the environment suitable for the seedling establishment and so encourage the development of mangrove forests. This here represents some of, some of those innovations and interventions, both individually and use them together. <clears throat> because one of the things was the research would have shown that individually, while they may have been successful together, some of them provided and gave better results in the outcome. So what were some of the key outcomes in terms of using these interventions? And I would have identified the interventions there on the left to the left of the slide and the key outcomes. Again, increase awareness, development of the mangrove forest, capturing and holding of sediments, therefore reducing sediment loss to the marine environment, which is very important. Persons might not think it is important, but when one considers the fact that the fisheries is out there and we depend a lot on the fishery resources, too much of sediment, while some of it is good, some might very well not be very good, but, and then it traps in the sediment and the mud, thus increasing the coastal elevation. They helped in consolidating soil, trapping seeds, encouraging the mangrove forest development, and ultimately promoting natural regeneration of the mangrove forest along the coast. Overall, in terms of the efforts of the mangrove restoration project, over 500,000 seedlings were planted at about 19 sites along the coast, and about 500 hectares of mangroves have been restored. The current estimates of mangrove cover now stand at approximately 33,000 hectares, moving up from about a low of 32,000 over the years. The carbon storage potential of mangroves, one would not um, debate that at this particular point in time because it has been recognized significantly so. And by increasing the acreage of mangroves out there, we have also been increasing our carbon storage potential of our local mangrove forests. Again, the coastal protective function of the areas, of the mangroves for the areas has also improved. And the research has shown that with mangrove the forests that has about 500 meet meters width, they offer scope not only for the protection, but also for some amount of self-regeneration. Habitats have been provided for some coastal species. And again, opportunities for research and community livelihood pursuits. Now, in terms of the community livelihood pursuits, it even began with the planting of the mangroves because seedlings, nurseries were established and some community members were engaged in operating those seedling nurseries. They earned some money for it and they provided the seedlings that were planted along the coast. In terms of the results of the replanting efforts, I must say not all of the sites had the same rate of success. While some would have had 100% success, there were some that would have had zero success. But these are all lessons and lessons well learned because not only did they inform future activities, but they also would have informed the mangrove restoration project um, staff and allow them to be able to share these experiences with other places who might then be experiencing the same things and are willing to actually learn from our national experience. In terms of looking at how good they were, 
this is a picture of one area before and after the planting of about 21,000 seedlings. After about three to four years, this is the state of the mangrove forest there. In combination with the man-made structure, it offers significant protection to the coast. And it has been, I must say, this was around 2014, the after. And I must say that today it is even um, thicker and it's working very well. Unfortunately, there have been some areas where the before and the after look the same, but that might have been because in terms of the location where the replanting activity was undertaken, a proper assessment of the environmental conditions was not done or the conditions were not suitable for the replanting. And that in itself contributed to the failure of the seedlings to actually take root and develop. If one looks at this graph, we will see that from a low, as I said, of in 2011 of about 22,000 um, hectares, now in 2018, and now we're seeing in excess of about 33,000 hectares mangrove cover, and it just keeps improving, and that in itself is encouraging. What the project has also done to show us that mangroves can, all, can be very useful is that it has allowed for consultants and for staff to look at alternative ecological mangrove rehabilitation techniques, combine them with coastal engineering initiatives and examine how they can be efficient, how they can be used to improve decision-making as it relates to coastal restoration activities. What this flowchart shows is some of, are some of the conditions that will speak to or say if um, the evaluation or assessment of a natural site is done, whether or not it would be possible for you to engage in any kind of replanting, or if it's one that you should not engage in the replanting, but you should seek alternative protective measures. What does it all mean for coastal management? Coastal management, in my opinion, is one that will engage and that will take in a holistic approach to management because you're managing people, you're managing places, you're managing spaces, you're managing activities, and you're managing events. So to do that, one would have to recognize the stresses or the stresses that the environment will normally suffer from. And if one can reduce or remove those stresses, well, then one can probably achieve holistic management. And to do so, there are a number of things that one would have to engage in and that have been engaging the authorities in Guyana so that we can improve our coastal management, such as improving our legislative capacity, even though one of the key things that still has to be done is to definitely have a, de a definition of what constitutes our coastal zone. At the moment, the, the coastal plain, the entire coastal plain, because of the kind of influence that we're having, is, is considered as the coastal zone, and it works. But we need to have improved legislative um, definitions, improved capacity building. And one of the other um, things that I think is really important is to have an improved mangrove action plan. The last one was for the period 2010 to 2012. We are in 2021. We have had numerous um, successes in terms of technologies and concepts. And I think personally that we need to incorporate those technologies and concepts in a new action plan. The question that I would want to ask after looking at the fact that yes, we can use mangroves as a form of natural sea defense, recognizing that they can play an integral role in an ICZM program as an innovative approach, can the DPSIR framework be used? The DPSIR framework has been used to identify pressures, drivers of change and impacts to enable um, managers to come up with initiatives and responses for managing natural resources. And the question I would want to ask is, can this framework be used to come up with responses, proper responses, effective responses for integrated coastal zone management? So I would say that yes, 
there is a need to identify and understand the underlying drivers that are responsible for reducing the mangrove cover and to find a, a framework that can be used would be one of the things that we definitely need to use to look at um, quite urgently. Now, if these are addressed adequately, it may just be possible for Guyana to achieve sustainable integrated coastal zone management and protection through mangrove conservation and management. This initiative to restore and plant new mangrove forests has contributed to carbon sequestration through mangrove reforestation and conservation. And it can further impact Guyana's climate change adaptation efforts through the strengthening of its natural sea defenses while protecting the coastal zone and its associated resources. This has been proven time and again, and the mangrove successes, the successes in the mangrove program that we have had is testimony to that. So in conclusion, what um, do I see? Mangroves have proven to be a good and effective first line of natural coastal defense for they offer protection to both terrestrial and marine coastal environments. We need to increase our efforts to conserve and protect them because they are good carbon sinks. They are rich in biodiversity. They can provide resilient livelihoods for coastal communities. They provide opportunities for community livelihoods in terms of beekeeping, aquaculture, and ecotourism. And I'm not just putting these there. These are things that have actually happened in one community, there is a beekeeping um, project that has been very successful. In another area, there have been aquaculture projects that have been successful. And in another area, in another community, excuse me, an ecotourism venture has been quite successful. Ultimately, they can contribute to coastal resilience, which is a desirable quality. Coastal management policy and practice should therefore always seek to maximize this coastal resilience because without it, we are not going to have the kind of protection in the coast. Communities are not going to be able to quote unquote bounce back from these harmful and negative impacts of climate change. And at the same time, we will definitely not be able to enjoy, as the Vice Chancellor said earlier on, that drive as you go to work and from work that drive along the Atlantic Ocean, we could very well lose that. And then we will again be just like many others who do not experience that um, rich experience. So my final statements, I would want to say in Guyana where certain resources are limited, but innovative actions abound, using mangroves for coastal protection to enhance ICZM and marine management should not be overlooked. It can only help if the use of mangroves in coastal management is further incorporated into coastal risk reduction strategies, protocols for climate change adaptation, and coastal development planning. And that's important because the mangroves, they can and do protect us. So I, I think that the onus is on us to protect them. And I would want to say thank you for the opportunity of making this very brief presentation and thank you for listening. And I do hope that during the question and answer session, we would be able to elaborate on a few more things because we only had a limited time to make a presentation and there's only so much that one can put in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dasiva. Uh, I want to sincerely say thanks to you for the presentation, but in a nutshell, what he has really emphasized is that mangrove can protect and does protect. And we've seen the evidence of it, um, of this in the restoration effort of our coastal environment. So um, without much ado, I uh, will see, I, I mean, uh, if you have any question, please, uh, the, you can make use of the Q and A section on the on Zoom. And um, well, the question we will we'll put it forth to our panelists. Uh, Moving on, I want to uh, bring on board the second panelist for our own presentation. But before she comes on board, um, every of our participants and attendees 
please try to uh, register uh, your participation. The link has been provided uh, so that we, we, we are taking the, uh, the record of the attendance and uh, you will be sent, if you put in your details, you'll be sent the certificate of participation of in, in this particular um, webinar and panel discussion. And also somebody has asked for uh, the presentation, the, uh, the PowerPoint of the today's presentation. So if you provide your details, we'll make arrangements on how to circulate this. So thank you very much. So the next uh, person that will be making a presentation is no other person but that uh, than Ms. Linda Johnson Bola, who is a lecturer and researcher in the Faculty of Art and Environmental Sciences. She's currently the head of the Department of Geography. She has a Master's of Science degree, uh, re research from the University of West Indies, a Bachelor of Arts degree in Geography from the University of Guyana, and a Certificate of Education in Geography from the University of Guyana. She has served as coordinator of the School for, of Health and Environmental Sciences for a number of years, and she has been serving as United, University of Guyana's representative on the Ge Geography Syllabus Review Panel for the Caribbean Secondary Ed Certificate Education since 2012. She's a member of International Geoscience Education Organization, an associate editor and peer reviewer for common grant publishers and some other professional organizations. She's also the co-founder of Guyana Planning Association and her research interests are in the area of mangrove management, coastal geomorphology, housing and community development, land use planning and geographical education. She has a number of publications in peer review journals and has a book that she authored, which is currently in the process of being published by the University of Guyana Press. So our colleagues, and our participants, please join me in welcoming Ms. Linda Johnson Bula to deliver the presentation. Over to you, Linda. Thank you very much, moderator, uh, Dr. Oyodotun, uh, for your introduction and warm words of welcome. And a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to you, wherever you are. It's such a pleasure being here today to make this presentation and to supplement the work that my colleague has just presented. And so I'll be focusing mainly on the challenges of coastal and marine management in Guyana. And uh, yes, so in order to set the context for the challenges which I will be addressing, it is important to emphasize you know, what happens along the coast geographically in order for persons to have an appreciation of the geographical setting of the highly valued coastal and marine spaces. As such, I'll be providing a brief overview of these, uh, as well as the associated threats and the, mainly the challenges of coastal and marine management. And then I'll conclude my presentation. And so the coastal plain is a relatively narrow mud flat that stretches approximately 459 kilometers uh, and eight to 65 kilometers wide. In fact, 459 kilometers in length and eight to 65 kilometers in width. And so it extends from the Quarantine River from the east here, all through to Whiny Point in the Northwest that's close to the Venezuela area. And the plane takes up just about 8%. If you look carefully at this illustration, you'll see it's a narrow band. And I'm speaking about this cream area highlighted here on the north, northern coast of Guyana. So just about 8% of close to 215,000 square kilometers of land, which the country occupies. But it has a very, very interesting feature. And that is the elevation is not uniform and as such varies from two meters below sea level to three meters above mean sea level. Interestingly too, the coastal zone has a section known, the coastal plain, sorry, has a section known as the coastal zone, which we all know by now, it's not uh, legislatively um, delineated. And so that needs to be revisited. 
but we consider it to be the coastal zone. It comprises of a system of marine and riverine deposits. So much of the land currently in use in this zone is below main high tide mark. The marine area begins 20 kilometers from the shoreline. So here we have the shoreline. Uh, I need to get one second, please. Yes, yeah, so the shoreline begins from where we have the, where I'm pointing here and extends to the dense black lines that are shown. So that entire area is referred to as our exclusive economic zone. And so usually the distinguishing mark for that zone is the line where brackish coastal waters meet ocean waters. And so the zone extends to the boundaries of the exclusive economic area. Altogether, the country has a total of 146, 890 square kilometers of highly valued coastal zone and marine region to really manage properly. And so the geographical position of the coastal and marine regions makes them extremely important as they play a major role in the country's growth and development. For example, the coastal zone is a magnet for residential, industrial, and commercial uses, with the main concentration being adjacent to the coastline. And this is important for us to recognize. The majority of the population and many of the activities are concentrated along or close to the coastline. So pressure for coastal and marine development has been aggravated by the migration of population from rural areas to coastal urban ones. And so all of these scenarios pose threats to the integrity of this fragile coastal and marine ecosystems that we have there and ultimately management of the coastal zone or region. The threats therefore can be categorized as anthropogenic or natural. And so we have many of them that are highlighted here. The list is not exhausted. Unplanned urban expansion over fishing, mangrove harvesting. Uh, Mr. De Silva, my colleague, just spoke at length about mangrove management and those kinds of things. But I really want to highlight one burning threat on the, uh, the anthropogenic category. And that is the potential pollution associated with the operations of the oil and gas industry. And so I also want to highlight one on the natural side of things, the natural threats, and that is sea level rise that is associated with climate change. And it's not just sea level rise, but storm surges too. So these and other threats indeed pose serious challenges for us to manage our coastal and marine zones quite effectively and efficiently. So over the years, we have experienced lots of challenges in relation to the effective and efficient management of our coastal and marine uh, environment. And remember, I just mentioned that these areas are very fragile. And so these challenges persist today and are likely to be experienced in the future if concerted effort is not directed to addressing the issues now. And so I have here outlined the six main, issue, main uh, challenges which I wish to, to deliberate on. Firstly, there is a challenge with coordination and collaboration among the multiplicity of agencies with jurisdiction over coastal and marine resources management. For instance, there seem to be no clear line of separation of some of the statutory duties and responsibilities 
of various agencies. And some of these agencies that have jurisdiction over the management of coastal resources as well as marine resources include the River and Sea Defense Division of the Ministry of Public Works, the National Drainage and Irrigation Authority, which is under the Ministry of Agriculture. We also have the Diana Forestry Commission and many others, including the Environmental Protection Agency. All of them have jurisdiction over coastal resources. So that's the challenge, coordination and collaboration among these agencies. The second challenge I wish to highlight has to do with legislative reform. Taking cognizance of new and emerging environmental issues. Some of the access statutes that we have in place are either fragmented or archaic, rendering themselves unsuitable for addressing some of the current issues and new and emerging ones that will affect the coastal and marine regions of this country. And so one example of a legislation that fits this category is the Fisheries Act of 1957. The Fisheries Act of 1957, which deals with marine reserves and fishing priority areas. Now this act is more than 60 years old. And so the effectiveness of this legislation, of course, its applicability are questionable. You know? However, we are aware that initiatives are being taken at the moment, um, some have started a few years ago, to address this deficiency. I can make reference to the River and Sea Defense Division. They have recently drafted a bill, which, well, not a bill, but they have prepared the document for it to be uh, deliberated at the various levels in order for some changes to be made to the legislative aspects for the River and Sea Defense Division. And that was done mainly uh, taking into context sea level rise, storm surges, and the implications they have for coastal protection, especially dealing with the hard engineering structures. So some measures are being taken but there are many, many more things that have to be done in terms of reforming our legislation. Implicit in legislative reform is addressing land tenure issue. And this has been recognized in many cases, including the execution of the mangrove project, which Mr. De Silva uh, just spoke about. So legislative reform incorporates all of these different facets that I've just mentioned. The third challenge I wish to identify is the weak enforcement systems that we have in place. And so encroachment on sea defense and river defense reserves has had over the years um, been prevalent. Over the years, this has been prevalent and of course has led to flooding in areas such as Anna Catarina, Cornelia, Ida, and Region 3, that is in Esquipo Islands, West Demerara, persons live within the boundaries of the reserve. And mind you, they're literally blocking primary drainage infrastructure. The drainage system runs parallel to the coastline and the channels over top water or flood waters into the sea through sluices. So imagine the implications, imagine the implications for encroachment on such a vulnerable and important area. And so encroachment also impedes access to dams and other pathways to carry out routine uh, works. The third, the fourth challenge is ineffectual culture of compliance. And this is attributed in part to the weak legislative and institutional structure that exists. So for example, penalties for non-compliance are limited. A point of reference is the Sea and the Sea Defense Act of 1998, which states that removal of earth, shell, seaweed, vegetation, etc., from any sea defense or from any land 
along the foreshore within one mile, one half mile of mean high tide mark is liable to a fine of $12,000. That is equivalent to a paltry sum of 60 US. You know? So in some cases too, the penalties are non-existent. So it's not a case where the penalties are very low, but they are non-existent. Also, very little or no incentive exists to encourage landowners to participate in the protection and management of our coastal and marine resources. You know? The fifth challenge is keeping the coastline free of pollutants you know, that are disposed in rivers, streams, and canals along the coast. And some of the materials are also brought down from higher locations and elevations via rivers and streams, and uh, they're deposited in these lower areas. The sixth, I'm oh, sorry, the sixth has to do with mobilization of resources to implement initiatives meant to address coastal and marine management. And so, Initiatives such as the mangrove restoration or rehabilitation and replanting, strengthening of sea defense infrastructure, as well as conducting research and continuous monitoring of both natural and human activities that compromise these two regions you know, are necessary. And so these are only six of the many challenges that confront the management of or affect the management of our coastal and marine resources. And so if all of the aforementioned challenges are not addressed properly, the coast and as well as the marine area will continue to be exposed to various risks and vulnerabilities. And so in concluding, I wish to emphasize that some of the risks that are likely to be experienced or erosion resulting from the loss of soil, which in turn will affect economic and social activities. And uh, it's important to note also that about 45% of our coastline is currently being affected by erosion. And of course, climate change induced sea level rise and storm surge are expected to exacerbate this issue. And so there is also prolonged and frequent flooding, which could lead to the spread of diseases. And we can recall what occurred in 2015 with the outbreak and spread of leptospirosis. So other risks involve contamination of near shore fisheries. Uh, we have a number of, of bottom feeders that exist in that area. There is also exhaustion of fishing stocks on the mining of sea defense structure and saline water intrusion. And uh, importantly, conflicting land uses will continue to occur along the coastal zone in particular. We all know that some of these are conflicting land uses are as a result of contrary policy actions. And uh, in this case here, the need for the integrated coastal zone management plan to be revised is opportune. As it is, the plan leaves room for different actors to engage in all kinds of activities in sensitive locations along the coast in particular. And so it also informs that there is need for scientific data, which can be acquired through research in order to help policymakers, planners, and others to make informed decisions on the management of our coastal and marine resources. And so overall, what is likely to happen is that a number of negative consequences will prevail and these include the destruction of wetlands and habitats leading to biodiversity loss. And we have a whole host of special uh, 
special types of, of biodiversity along our coast. For example, at Shell Beach in Essequibo Islands, we, in the Essequibo, we have our marine turtles nest there. We have scarlet I, ibis birds and so forth that will inhabit the mangrove areas and offshore areas. So many, many consequences are likely to occur and uh, they extend to include damage to crops because as we are aware, agriculture is one of the main economic activities undertaken along the coast. Loss of livestock, infrastructure, uh, in, impact our livelihoods and ultimately affect and destroy our coastal and marine assets. So managing our coastal and marine environment is a priority, is a priority for us to ensure that the marine and coastal assets are protected and conserved, but at the same time, human beings, the populations that exist along the coastal zone can continue to enjoy good living that is engaged in all kinds of livelihood activities without having you know, severe impacts on those coastal resources that we have existing. So with that, I would bring my presentation to an end and allow persons to ask questions during the time that is allocated for questioning. So thank you very much for paying attention to the presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Right, thank you, Linda. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, in a nutshell, um, our presentation focused on the challenges and threats of coastal and marine environment. Some notes have been taken, some questions have been written down, and I, I can take note that there are some questions that have come in uh, to the chat. But please, let those questions keep coming. Before we start um, the panel discussion, uh, I would like the next presentation to be done so that uh, when we get the pre presentation out of the way, all the questions can be uh, then asked. So the next person that will be presenting to to us today is in is a is somebody that I know very well and very dear to me. He's not a mean person in status, and he's not a mean person in status. So um, she is no other person but Dr. Helen Bonningham. Uh, currently, the vice dean in charge of research for Faculty of Social and Historical Sciences. An associate professor in physical geography, Department of Geography, University College London. The central focus of Dr. Bonningham's research is to explain coastal behavior, systems dynamics, and mechanisms of forcing over decades to centuries time scales. In particular, our research roles, our research explores the relationship or uh, the relative importance of intrinsic system control versus external climate forcing on the geomorphology and morphodynamics of coastal sedimentary systems. She's also interested in understanding and capturing the geomorphological controls on coastal ecosystems. For over the years, approximately about 26 years, she has done some researches that are sponsored by notable organizations and research institutes globally, many of them that I cannot begin to atomize. So currently, she has over 83 publications, and she has supervised and graduated at least 12 PhD candidates, and currently supervised three PhD students. This is in addition to plethora of many MSCs and numerous BSc graduates who have passed through a leadership our guidance and our tutelage. In terms of education, she has Doctor of Philosophy in Coastal Studies uh, with research on morphodynamics of West Donegal Estuary with a distinction at, uh, from the University of Ulster and a BSc first class combined science from the University of Lancaster. Among our PhD, many of our PhD graduates have been doing excellently well all over the world. And I can say one of the PhD graduates that passed through her is the one speaking now. It's a privilege for me to, to know her. She made me to know about coastal geomorphology. 
and uh, I was about four and a half years under our tutelage. So, Helen, good to see you and good to have you here. And thanks for um, coming on board. It's over to you. Take it off. Thanks, Tammy Topian. It's good to see you again <laughs> after all this time. Um, yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon from the, the UK. So, um, as Temi Toby says, I'm, I'm very much a, a coastal scientist who's large, largely interested in coastal behaviour, but I think more recently I've um, become much more connected with different ways of engaging different communities in understanding more about our coastal systems, broadly to try and improve the way that we, that we manage them and, and deal with them. So what, what I've put together this afternoon is really just a... Uh, a way of, I guess, advocating a, a need to connect and um, encourage that kind of widening participation in coastal science and, and governance. And I'm going to just kind of go through some of the, the context and, and backdrop to that as to why we would, we would go about um, kind of engaging these wider communities. Um, and then I'll give some examples through a particular case study um, of a site that I'm working on at the moment where we've got a range of different activities um, taking place that are involving the communities in, in various ways. So just as a kind of a bit of a um, backdrop, when we think about engaging people in communities, then we think on the one hand, we can, we can think about this from a top-down perspective. So the fact that as in science and research, we often want to kind of reach out to uh, communities, to people, we want to translate our research to communities, we want to educate, we want that knowledge exchange to, to work. Um, and it's also the case in terms of decision making and government, governance that from a top down perspective, there's a need to connect out to communities, to people, to get them involved in order to get a better understanding of the perspectives and viewpoints. Um, so that kind of consultation process. But that sort of connection also works from the bottom up in the sense that we have multiple communities um, around the world who are undertaking their own recording, advancing their own understanding, informing um, their kind of local um, systems in terms of getting information and kind of involving those local communities and um, developing those social connections. And by, by doing so, they are building kind of a consensus or at least an, an understanding of the difference, difference thing differences of opinion and, and perspective on certain kind of specifically environmental issues and what that does is it generates a kind of a co community resource or a community contribution um, to the knowledge base so that we have this kind of enhanced knowledge base by building information coming out of, of communities um, but also what they're doing in that bottom-up kind of perspective is actually establishing social connect connections and networks and activities that then actually might benefit um, governance, decision making and um, science and research. So actually, these whether it's top down or bottom up, we're actually kind of coming at the same um, kind of problems or questions um, from multiple angles. So there really is no reason to, to not include this wider range of people um, in the research and science that we undertake, and also in terms of decision making, because bringing more and more people to the table is always going to benefit the, the process um, in, the, in the long term. Now, another slightly different perspective is to think about the kind of educational framework. So this is kind of the Bloom's classic Bloom's taxonomy of um, kind of educational framework. The extent to which you engage with something um, has a bearing on um, your, your, your gain from that process, as in um, the kind of understanding, um, the experience and the literacy, I suppose, you, you get from that process. So if you, if you only tangentially involve yourself in something, you might remember it. Um, but you're not going to really have a very connected understanding with something. So the more involved you get, the more involved you get in the, in the analytical process, in the evaluation, in the assessment, the increased kind of literacy, scientific literacy you get from that involvement. But if we kind of step aside from kind of the educational framework and think about it in the context of, of science more generally, research more generally, um, and decision making, then that, that same kind of hierarchy and that shift towards this increasing scientific literacy matches with the uh, an increasing engagement with um, 
kind of questions and problems within um, kind of local communities. You get an increased kind of resilience within those communities when dealing with problems, when dealing with things like uh, the challenges of, of climate change. And you get an increased sustainability in the decision making process because you're all investing, you have communities who are, who are investing in themselves. And that generates a much longer term kind of resilience and sustainability to the, the decision making process. So it's really important not only to just get people to connect with, with processes, but also to try and connect them at these higher levels to get them involved in the analysis, the evaluation, the understanding, because that's going to benefit. Um, the management, the decision making, and even science uh, at the end of the day. Now, there are different ways that we can engage communities, engage public, um, and this is just a very simplified kind of expression of the those those different kind of modes, I suppose, of, of in public involvement. So we have kind of engagement where you outreach, you kind of just connect rather more loosely to um, uh, different communities. You have involvement, which is much more consultative in the sense that you're actually involving people a bit more directly in the process. And then you have participation where people are getting involved in, a, in, in an exercise, in an activity, um, often through kind of crowdsourcing or um, uh, other forms of kind of citizen and citizen science. And then where these kind of all these activities kind of over, overlap um, is in a space that can actually be much more kind of effectively described as a kind of community based particip participatory research. And if we can kind of move towards that, then we are we are really ticking the boxes in terms of those different types of engagement and moving the, the people involved through those hierarchies to those upper levels, those, those higher kind of literacy levels and those le higher levels of engagement leading to higher um, sustainability and, and resilience within communities. So that's kind of a bit of a backdrop to what I'm then gonna just kind of go through in terms of some of the things that we're doing um, at a site in, in Suffolk. So, um, the Deben Estuary is a, is a place that I've been doing um, science, coastal science research for a number of, of years now. Um, and as I say, I've more recently got a bit more connected in, and involved in the um, kind of community side of things um, and also in terms of decision making and, and management. And this is a this is a relatively small estuary. It's just a one of the one of the one of the many estuaries in, in the UK. Um, but that map on the right there is um, illustrating that the, the estuary is actually very similar to Guyana in some set, some respects in the sense that so much of it is under um, sea level. So the, the blue kind of river running down the middle um, and either side of that you've got these green patches of salt marsh, that's the modern day estuary. But everything beyond kind of landward of the green is actually reclaimed land and so all of these broad um, floodplain areas here are actually behind a seawall and are below sea level. So there's vast areas of this estuary are actually very, very susceptible to um, kind of climate change and issues associated with climate change, but also decision making within the estuarine environment, because all the way along the estuary is a seawall. Um, that seawall would have been built hundreds of years ago and uh, in some, some places is having to be um, maintained in order to provide that coastal defence, uh, flood defence fu function. In other places it, it, it hasn't yet been maintained and needs to be ma maintained and therefore decisions need to be made in terms of whether or not that, that money is spent to maintain that sea wall um, in the context of everything else within the estuary and the the kind of the lack of sustainability, I suppose, of that sort of um, management decision making. So there are lots and lots of issues here which are commonly found around the world in the context of, of sea level rise and climate change. And we have a range of coastal communities, some who are very reliant on this estuarine environment, some who are less so, um, but people largely quite engaged with um, that environment. Um, so what we actually have in um, on the ground in terms of kind of community groups, I suppose, is that we first of all, we have a, a partnership, a deep estuary partnership. So in the UK, it's quite common to have a stakeholder network partnership um, for most kind of coastal um, systems. And these partnerships are usually there to provide a, a forum to make the decisions um, about the kind of management uh, flood defence options for uh, the estuary. So that's kind of a top down sort of perspective in a sense. It's a kind of a framework for 
for management. But then we have a number of other projects and groups um, kind of participating in different aspects of coastal um, science and research and decision making. We have a, a monitoring group down at Bordsey, which is near the mouth of the estuary. They, that's a community driven initiative to um, undertake environmental surveys of a beach. We have a, uh, an art science collaborative project that we're running at the moment to try and find other ways to engage different communities. And we have a new project that just started in January, um, the Bordsey Photo Post project, which is much more of a kind of citizen science crowd source type um, uh, collaborative project to try and enhance our knowledge base of um, processes and dynamics and behavior of the, um, of the site around Bordsey, where there are a number of very specific um, issues. So the partnership has been in existence, existence for a number of years now. They generated an estuary plan in 2015, but that actually needs to be updated already um, because it just it is it is already out of date. There are new kind of um, government uh, plans that are in place that have an Im impact on the way in which decisions are made within coastal um, areas. And so therefore, at the moment, the, the partnership's focus is largely about trying to kind of get um, a group of people together to actually start thinking about um, developing that plan forward. So at the moment, the, there's a there's a very clear focus for the, the deep industry partnership. So if we think about it in the context of, you know, what, what is the partnership actually doing from a kind of a community engagement perspective? Well, they it's definitely engaging with the community and stakeholders, but it's not doing that full time. It's, it's a bit ad hoc in the sense that it just it addresses problems as and when they arise. It's increasingly starting to kind of get connected with the idea of data gathering, but it's needing help because there's not really the, the mechanism at the moment, well, there hasn't been the mechanism to, to, to provide that data beyond the kind of national monitoring programs. Um, now, the analysis of data that's coming through is largely done by researchers or scientists like me, but not by the, the partnership themselves. So the community and the partnership aren't really involved in the analytical process. And decision-making is definitely, um, informed from a kind of in terms of the community and the stakeholders um, involved but as I say this is a this is not an entirely kind of full-time process so actually between the periods when plans are being developed um, the activities within the partnership tend to kind of um, become just kind of they build boil down to very specific issues rather than kind of a more collective um, approach. Now, a slightly different um, exercise or activity that's on, ongoing is our Deep and Soundings project. This is a, an art science kind of collaborative project. So I'm actually working with this, uh, with a, a fine art academic on this, pro on this project. And um, what we intended to do was to um, progress a number of different um, workshops and um, exercises to engage a range of different people and think about science from more of an art sort of perspective and process. So we were basically trying to bring different communities together to, to think about change within estuary landscape systems. Um, but also then try and through that process, start to encourage these people to participate much more in the governance process. Now, the problem we've got there is that this project started in January, 2020. COVID arrived in February 2020 and lockdown started in March 2020. So one of the biggest challenges of undertaking a, um, an engagement and participatory type project when you're in lockdown <laughs> is, was quite, was quite uh, a challenge, there's, there's no doubt. I mean, what, so what do you do when you can't actually go outside, you can't speak to people, you're you know, fixed in your location, you can't have any sort of connections with, with individuals. And so we had to move a lot of our exercises online. So we've got a really nicely developed website now. But one thing that we were able to do is when lockdown, when our first lockdown lifted, and before the second lockdown came on board, we were able to actually set up a COVID safe exhibition. So we, we took an exhibition art, an art space, um, and presented scientific um, information in the in the way that you would present an art um, um, kind of exhibition and people could come and go so it was on the high street so people could just pop in um, we kept numbers minimum to kind of um, to six you know within the government guidelines so everything was kind of done within a very covid safe way and it was actually 
quite remarkable. We we ended up bringing in far more people than we would have done um, if we had done this through the standard workshop um, type approach. Uh, because people could just drift in on, on their own kind of accords sort, sort of thing. And we ran it for an entire week. Um, and it, it was a really effective way of engaging that wider community and a, a completely different community to those that would ordinarily get involved in these sorts of things. And we tried to get some kind of interactive sort of processes involved. So we, we had maps where we asked people to kind of draw on the maps and identify locations that they felt were problematic or where issues um, were or where they knew something that um, they thought was important. And we're collating this sort of information and bringing it together um, in the project. And we've also started within our project something, again, we've been pushing this on uh, through the um, website mostly and through social media um, called a sounding change project where we are asking people to, in their own way, capture change throughout the course of a year. Um, so, for example, this is the sounding change diaries of two of our participants who are their artists. And um, so they one of them paints pictures and um, the other one takes photographs and um, she also writes so they they are involving they are engaging with the ideas of change within within estuary systems but through an art art kind of lens and this is really quite enlightening really from my perspective as a scientist because what you're starting to realize is that people people can engage with science in so many different ways and actually bringing more of that to the table um, ends up generating a, a much better discussion, a much more informed discussion, and, and really does connect across a much wider uh, community. So that project is definitely reaching um, a wider community, so we are definitely engaging communities in that. And in terms of informing decision making, we're not really there yet. Um, we What we want to be doing through this process is gathering evidence and perspective for which we can then feed back into the, the next version of the Deben estuary plan. Um, so that's something that we hope will come out over the next um, year or two. Now, another a, a very different project again, this is a Bordsy um, photo post project is something that we only started this year. We, we got a small bit of funding to set up these fixed point um, photo uh, posts around um, part of the estuary. And they're just very simple. They're just a wooden, a wooden structure with a, a kind of a, a, a fabricated mount at the top, just made in, uh, in metal, so at least it's robust. And the idea is, is that you can place a um, smartphone on there and anybody taking the photograph is basically taking exactly the same view. So if one person takes a photograph one day and another person takes a photograph the next day, it doesn't matter that they are on two different days. That's great because we're actually getting representation of different time frames. Um, but they are basically taking exactly the same view. So we can then use those to compare through um, time. And again, this has been a great kind of exercise. We've got four different posts at the moment. We are looking to, to set up a wider range. And already since January, we are getting a range of photographs, which in at the very least is showing us the range of weather that we get on the east coast of, um, of England. Uh, so far this year, we've had gloriously blue sky days and also snow and horrendous uh, storms. So the, the full suite of, uh, of weather. Um, but what's been really interesting already is that this, how informative this is going to be. So one of the biggest challenges in um, in coastal monitoring and understanding coastal behavior is that most of the national monitoring programs undertake surveys that are perhaps maybe, if you're lucky, it's an annual exercise. So you might, there might be a data set for a, a year and, and another data set for another year. What you're never gonna get is, is data that relates to every month or even every season. And here, we are getting data that is basically almost every day, if not every other day. Whoever's passing by, taking their dog for a walk, going for a walk just along the coast, going out for the day, they are taking photographs and uploading these to the dedicated uh, Facebook page. And that's giving us daily information about the way in which this coastal system is behaving. And even since January, what we've ended up, ended up seeing is um, the impacts of a storm event on cliff retreat, um, very small scale, but enough to um, allow 
me as a scientist to kind of have a better understanding of how cliffs behave, but also feeding back to the community, to the wider public, having getting them to have a better understanding of how coastal processes work. So back in early February, there was a, a, a quite a healthy beach and a berm protecting the, the base of the cliff. And at the bottom here, we've got the wave conditions as we go through February into March. And you can see basically at the beginning of February, we had quite a big storm. Um, and then following that, we had just these smaller scale kind of events, but nothing quite like the one. In fact, I, I haven't got the tide data on here because the storm in early February actually put the tide gauge out. So it caused a, a bit of destruction, that early storm. So anyway, we've got Fe 6th of February, 10th of February after the storm. You can see we've got a bit of snow there. There's a, been a bit of scarping along the cliff, but the beach is still in place. There's still some elevated berm areas. But then... Even after the storm, we've got some elevated water levels that are sufficiently high enough that they are bringing the waves to the base of the cliff there and starting to kind of really scarp that um, cliff face. So that in this one here, the water is actually right up against the cliff face. So you can see quite a sharp um, drop there now where it's fundamentally eroding um, the cliff. And then nothing much happens after that. So um, within a week or so of the uh, the storm we've got a cliff scarp um, and a beach still present still building up then after the storm at the end of um after the storm here and um, the beach is building up at the base of the cliff but then 10 days after the storm we start to see it's probably not that clear on here but uh, where the end of the arrow is there's a, a very slight failure in the cliff so the cliff starts to slump at that point and then following that slump we have another slump um, 18, 18 days post storm. And there you can see it quite nicely in that photograph there. So the, the storm itself didn't actually cause any erosion of the coast, not immediately. It consequently caused destabilization at the base of the cliff, which then consequently caused one landslip and then consequently caused another landslip. But we're talking, you know, two to three weeks of processes. And we've still got the landslip there. We've got a beach rebuilding at the base of the cliff there um, and then removal of that beach removal of the, the slip itself um, and then the beach oops the beach starts building back up again so this this sort of time um interval of, of information um is starting to give us a much better picture of of the dynamics of this particular cliff system uh, in a way that we would never get from the national surveys and we would rarely get from anything that was um, kind of a dedicated effort. This is something that's a community initiative, which is actually starting to inform us in an entirely different way on an entirely different level. Um, and it, uh, it's amazing that even within three months, we're already at this point where we can start to say something very quite, quite distinctive about these um, sites. So, Definitely, we've got an engaged community and it's increasing on a daily basis. Um, we, are count, we are counting the days in terms of the, the data that we're gathering through this. The analysis is still down to me or any other scientist who wants to be involved. So the community aren't quite so involved in the analytical side of things. They're quite happy to see the, the videos that I generate and they're quite happy to contribute and participate in the discussion of them, but they're not involved in the analytical um, side of things. And there's no clear framework for involving or incorporating this sort of um, data and information within the decision making process yet. But that's something that we can potentially build on now that we've got a resource base in front of us. Now, the final example, which I'll try and get through quite quickly, so we've still got time for um, uh, questions is a, another monitoring program that was um, set up by a group of people from Bordsey. Um, so this is this is the Bordsey Peninsula here. Um, and the main reason that the monitoring was undertaken was because you can, you can see this kind of line that runs all the way around the peninsula and you can see it exposed here. This is sheet piling, which is a, a defense. This is basically protecting this peninsula from um, erosion. And you can see it there, it's quite rusty. Uh, the end is actually eroding out. So you can see they've put lots and lots of rock armor at the, at the end there. Um, and a lot of the sheet piling looks like this. It's, it's quite decayed. Uh, I think it was put in back in the 1950s or 60s, so it's quite old. And the community wanted to start getting a, they, they felt that this beach was disappearing. So they started measuring it. 
So they um, measure it at, there's a total of, um, I think 20, 28 or 30 um, sections along this coast where they measured the beach level at the back next to where this um, sheet piling is. And they've been doing it for, for this section here since 2013 and for this section on the estuary um, since about 2016. Um, and this is again, an amazing data set. So this is a movie that I hope will um, work. This is showing every single survey that's been undertaken since 2013 of this particular beach system. Um, so what it's showing is the red line is, is the, the, the point that, that specific point in time. And then you can start to see the envelope of variability of that beach through time. So over the course of, of eight years, that beach, the beach levels are varying by you know, two or three meters. Um, but what you can see is there's a systematic shift, a systematic kind of um, erosion of this um, foreshore um, over time. And at the estuary margin, so this is comparing both the, est the estuary margin here and the beach here since 2016, um, a similar set of data, um, but telling us a different story. So in this particular area, we've just got bars that are moving into the estuary um, on a kind of cycle basis. So the, these two stretches of shoreline are actually behaving very differently over those timescales. And again, this is not information that you would get from national surveys, from the National Monitoring Programme, um, because they aren't undertaken at a frequent enough um, resolution in time. What this is able to give us is a much, um, much more kind of granular um, representation of that change um, at the location, but on a frequent enough basis that we can start to see where those kind of cyclicities are in the in the behaviour and start to understand the processes that are causing that change um, much more discreetly. So we were able to do some analyses of these, looking at the impacts of particular storms and so on. And the community, again, are incredibly engaged with this process. Um, they they plan everything. They all they have um, uh, red kind of um, programs and plans for who who does the monitoring each week. So it's all um, well organised. There's spreadsheets that the data is put into. So there's a very rigorous process there. Again, the downside here is that the that the analysis side of things is largely down to a researcher or an interested scientist. So the community themselves aren't able to do to undertake the um, the analysis. And also, it's unclear how the data can work its way into that decision-making process. The, the data is um, reported to the parish council and the uh, local council um, every month. But at the moment, there's no real um, indication that anybody's actually using the data to inform any decision-making um, on this coastline. And given at the moment, there's a big question at Mark over how this particular stretch of coastline is going to be defended in the long term. Um, it's, it's a bit unfortunate that there's this amazing set of data and no clear evidence that that's being used um, to inform the management side of things. So just kind of kind of bringing this all together, then what we've got in this particular site is we've got we've got involvement through um, partnership and consultation through partnership. We've got outreach and engagement through our um, art science project. We've got crowdsourcing citizen science sort of approach participation through the, the photo post and we've got Kind of a much more established monitoring program that is giving us that community-based participatory research but we still have many challenges so on the one level it's like it's a fantastic exercise a fantastic example of community driven research but we really need to make a lot of progress in terms of how we connect those dots um, because at the moment it feels a little bit too piecemeal. We need a framework that allows us to embed these, uh, this, all of these participation um, exercises and the data that they generate into the decision-making um, process. And we need to reduce the reliance on these just these few individuals that make the process work. So without me doing an, some analysis or without somebody organising the register or the rotor for the surveying, the whole thing would basically fall to pieces. And no, it, it, you know, so at the moment it's very much propped up by a few key individuals. So we need to understand how to make this a much more self-sustaining system so that in the longer term there's a there is a resilience to this this process but the take-home message is definitely involve people involve communities because the the information you can get through this process is is second to none really so that's my main point thank you sorry um 
thank you very much, Ellen. And uh, I want to sincerely thank all our panelists. Um, we've had so much from her, especially on widening participation in coastal science and governance, and how to engage people and communities, and how communities can contribute to knowledge. And several approaches have been discussed about top-down and bottom-up approaches. Uh, but most of these involved involvement uh, involve communities, stake, stakeholder network partnership, and uh, initiative plans. So uh, we've heard from two, uh, three panelists, and I would like to uh, invite all our panelists to come on board uh, because there have been a couple of questions that have been put forward uh, to, to us. In the, in the interest of time, I will first of all start reading the questions that we have, and I will also, um, if any other person have any questions, please uh, send this one up. But for now, we have about 14 questions. Let me start from, um, give me a few seconds, please. Um, from, I'm not sure whether it's a mister or miss, and um, pardon me if I don't pronounce the name very well. It's Diwa Putu, um, uh, Diwa Putu Oka Prasyasa from Steaming and Diani in Bali. And the, this question is go to Mr. Philip Da Silva. What impact, what impact ma mangrove project with ecotourism uh, development in your country? So I think the question is about what's the impact of mangrove project on ecotourism? All right, thank you very much. Um, if I understand clearly, the impact that it has had is that um, one of increasing the awareness, but I think one of the more important things that the, I, I would point out is that it has helped and promoted the coastal resource inventory. Because um, knowing not only in terms of ecology, the species that we have, but also knowing a bit more about communities involved and the um, history, et cetera, of those two or three communities that are involved in promoting ecotourism. I think those are two positive impacts that practicing ecotourism and having the mangrove as a central feature has um, helped in terms, in, in that regard. So in terms of helping to increase our coastal resource inventory in terms of the ecosystem, habitats, and the community history, I will say. Good. Um, thank you very much. Uh, please let me move on to, do uh, the, any other panelists, do you want to make another contribution to this question? Ms. Bola, Dr. Boniam? Now, okay, let me move on to the second question. Now, this question says from Joan Wardrum, saying, do the community members expre express any dis dissatisfaction or interest in taking part in the data analysis aspect of the project? I think this one is going to Dr. Bonihan. Ellen? Yeah, so at the moment, um, it's not that they express do the community members? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Um, so at the moment, they, they don't express dissatisfaction. Um, it's, it's a lack of capability in a sense. So we're, we've I've actually just been applying for some money to try and um, build some systems that allow um, a much simpler and broader range of analyses of those data. Um, so I mean, one of the biggest problems is, you know, data is much more widely accessible now to everybody. We can we can all get hold of data. But one of the challenges is that in many cases, the data require dedicated softwares to to use and visualize and, mo and modify and analyze. And, and most people don't have access to those sorts of things. So what we ne what actually need is a is a better range of online tools that are simple enough for for people who are perhaps less um, well versed in that or less experienced in, in that sort of analysis to at least look at the data and understand it. I'm not expecting people to be able to do advanced statistics or advanced analyses, but just being able to actually make sense and process data that has been gathered in, in enough of a way that they then can 
use that kind of knowledge and that understanding to help inform their decision making. So I think at the moment it's a process and we, we simply don't have the tools that allow people to engage with the data in an effective way. It's not that they're not interested. Hmm, interesting. So, but uh, follow up on that. Is it something that you're thinking of doing in the future where the people can have um, engagement with, um, with data, the collected data? Is, it, is there any facilities you are thinking about um, that will bring their involvement, especially members of community, after the data might have been collected um, yeah. in, in the near future? Is there something you're thinking about? Yeah, so I mean, there are there are some online tools already available um, so that um, they work specifically with the kind of citizen science um, data that exists out there. So there are there are simplified methods to kind of present data. Um, some of the national data sets that are collected are now being visualized online using things like Plotly tools with it in, that are embedded within websites. So people can actually plot the wave height, plot um, the tide level on a very simple plot enough that they can then understand what the data is showing. Um, so what we, the, the challenge I suppose is actually enabling that sort of um, tool to work with, with data that's collected locally. So most of these things just need something to con connect the dots. You know, it isn't, you can't just go from A to B, you have to find some way of connecting the two. And that's where the challenges lie because no, nobody's willing to spend the money to do that. They're quite happy for a, a community to go out and collect data for free, but nobody's really investing in that kind of that space between the data and the people and 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 what it can actually demonstrate and show in terms of science and, and management. Uh, good. Uh, any other person wants to follow up? Uh, any of the panelists wants to follow up on this? But uh, no, if not, I have another question for you before I let you off the hook to go to another panelist, uh, Ellen. Another question here for you from Mr. Um, Dr. Owe Bove. How did you address conflict resolution in your project? And has there been any, let me ask, has there been any conflict about the ongoing project? And uh, if, there, if there are, how do you address any conflict resolution, uh, any conflict, um, and how do you resolve it? Yeah, so there, there are definitely com conflicts of interests, um, particularly in terms of, um, the best um, methods and approaches for um, maintaining coastal defences and, and what to do about the coastal defences in the longer term. Um, and and it's, I'm not suggesting that it's easy by, by any means. It's, it's, it really does require many, many, many meetings. So having co multiple conversations, but bringing everybody to the table as, as frequently as possible, but also collectively as possible so that to try and re reduce the number of times you're meeting with a small group, um, because that that tends to lead to um, people thinking that they've heard, they, they have a particular knowledge that somebody else doesn't have. So we've always got to try and find a way of bringing com the communities together on a regular basis um, to voice opinions and to kind of try and push towards a consensus. And obviously Im embedded in that has to be a really strong scientific basis so you know we need the science and we need the um, the models to help inform those those processes and then it's a matter of trying to get people around the table but it's not straightforward at all okay but please try to pick up on what you said last that we need science but please bear in mind that most of the community members may not be scientists or may not have some of um understanding of some of us uh, scientific jargons so how do you address such kind of things? How do you communicate um, the communicate with the communities in the language that they, they do the world understand? Um, how have you been handling that? Well, I mean, I, I think for, from certainly from my perspective, I don't I don't tend to. Um, I mean, I, you always have to bring the right people to the table. So, you know, I'm not an expert on everything <laughs> at all. So if, if we're if we're talking about um, the decisions about a particular low low um, topography zone that is currently protected by a seawall. That seawall, in order to sustain, in order to deliver its um, flood defence fu function, has to be raised. 
by a certain amount in order to do that. Now, in order to have the, the right conversation and the right information, you need people who know about the engineering side of things, people who have undertaken modeling, people who know how sea level is going to change in the future. You know, and you, you want to have as many of those people who have the expert knowledge on those aspects around the table. So that, that when you're having the conversation with people that um, have issues with the, the decisions or that the, a decision can't be um, uh, reached as a consensus, then we have the right people who have the, the core, raw knowledge and science and understanding to underpin it. But it, again, it's not, it's not an immediate process. It's, it, you know, it takes time. Um, and I have, I have been in situations where people have gradually shifted their mindset as they have gradually understood more and more about the implications of, of climate change in particular. Um, and people do shift in terms of their perspective once they are in, once become informed and they understand. Thank you very much. Uh, while I allow you to take some break or maybe take water because you have one or two more questions for you, but I would like to go on to Linda. You did make mention why you are doing the presentation about the issue of the legislation, the, the, the legislation. So there's a specific question for you: that how do we address the fragmented legislation? And uh, um, well, you, you said it that um, the legislative reform is needed because our current legislation are fragmented and archaic. That we have some archaic status using some of the things you said. But a question is coming for for you here. That how do you, how would you, how should this one be addressed? Thank you very much for that question, moderator. Now the, the matter can be addressed from various perspectives. One, we have to ensure that we have an updated integrated coastal zone management strategy and plan that outlines the various facets for collaboration and the coordination of activities that relate to the management of the coastal and marine environment. And in doing so, laws would have to be enacted, especially to deal with climate change issues, you know, storm, storm surges and sea level rise and so forth. These are new issues that have not been factored into many of our legislative, uh, in, in the legislative framework to be specific. And so it starts from having that policy document identifying the different areas that need to be brought into the legal framework. And then persons who specialize in addressing these legally are asked to work on those documents. You know? The other thing is, to, is that there is need for research to help inform the legislation too. For example, we all know that the sea defense uh, statute that I mentioned in 1998 act that I mentioned earlier. It also caters for not only removal of materials from close to the coastline, but it also caters for protection of lands only 50 feet away from the coastline. That's 50 feet inland from the coastline. And so we all know that that quantum of space is inadequate for coastal protection. Therefore, the data has to inform how much more should be considered landward for legislation to be enacted to protect that particular zone. So the bottom line is that there are many, many uh, steps and strategies that can be taken, um, but I just want to inform, I just want to mention one other. There must be, and I'm stressing, there must be that desire at the level of government to ensure that legislations are enacted and amended to address some of these issues. There must be a desire because if the political will is not there, nothing will, you know, nothing will be advanced, right? Okay. So that's another area we have to focus on. The political will is highly needed. So thank you, Linda. But before um, I let you off the hook and I did, did, there are two questions that I would like uh, Mr. Da Silva and um, Ms. Bola to respond to. This question is from Timo Leslie, uh, from um, um, Mario 
Cabral from Timor Leste said, this question is addressed to Professor Philip and Professor Linda. How long has Guyana been implementing the inter uh, ICZM and what kind of the key lessons learned and best practices, including decision support tools that have been applied? Could you play, please share um, the information about this? That's number one. And there's a follow up, another question that is similar to that is this Is there an updated intercoastal zone management action plan for Guyana? And this one's been directed to Mr. Uh, Philip da Silva. So the two, of, the two questions, I think they are uh, related, and um, uh, both Linda and Philip can go ahead in answering it. So over to you. Hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, to answer the last one, in terms of an updated ICZM action plan, the answer is no. Um, the last one was in 2000, um, and to date we have not had um, an updated action plan. There have been efforts to get to that point, but those efforts have not borne fruit up to now. In terms of lessons, what I will say is that um, among the key lessons, Linda would have mentioned one just now, the need for legislation. Um, they were also, I think Linda also mentioned about the land tenure issues. There is the aspect of data collection and the whole need to improve interagency collaboration. Previously, the interagency group that made up that ICZM interagency, the agencies that made up the group, the membership, even though the membership would have attended meetings, very often the parties were not um, given the authority to make decisions. So the time taken between meetings and between actions was always very long. And so things got left behind rather than got completed. Also in terms of the tools, I, I am aware that they have used um, the GIS in most instances, but they have concentrated more on approaches, looking at more community co-management and for both the man, ICCM and the mangrove aspect, they have used the co community co-management approach. For the mangrove um, aspect as it relates to ICZM, there, was the, there were mangrove rangers that were employed and utilized to do data collection and monitoring. And also there was the establishment of what they call the VMACs, the village mangrove action committees and at the village level at the community level those members were able to bring the kind of information and be involved in the process the challenge there i think um dr helen has mentioned some of the challenges that would have been um, observed where not only willingness but also the expertise of persons and so training would have been a key issue in that there. So not only tools, but they focus more on approaches, which was a bit more relevant to us at that time. Now that they have so much more information, it would be very important for us to look at the kind of tools. And if my memory serves me correct, the mangrove management program right now, they are looking to engage in terms of developing a particular platform so that they can do better data analysis and um, utilize that information that is available to inform decisions. And that would Thank be my you. contribution to that. Thank you. Well, our time is up already, but um, I've asked for at least the next 10 minutes to, be, to see if we can quickly address some of our questions. Um, please let us try to be succinct. This question, uh, is it possible, and that's for Mr. Da Silva, is it possible for mangroves to be regenerated along Guyana's coast where there's the construction of reprap rock sea defense structures? I would is say that the, the possibility may exist, but one would need to undertake um, field assessments to look at like things like the coastal dynamics and the mud 
mud flows, etc., before one can actually definitively say that it can happen. There's lots of um, field work that has to go into before a decision is made as in the right spot for planting. Okay, thank you. There's an, another question here that there's is, um, some, uh, Ms. Simmons is interested in a, in a sense of where implementation of IZZM has been a success. Could any of the presenters identify a place or a country where the implementation has addressed coastal stressors? And for that country, could some of the good practices or guiding principles be highlighted? I think this is going to be like a big thesis. But if you know of a country that have had a success with it, just make mention of it, and we'll try to go and find out how they went about it. All right, I can jump in there. I can say Barbados, I know, has had very good success. They have actually established a coastal zone management unit. They have a policy framework for coastal zone management. There are policies that would address things like um, sustainability standards and procedures, conservation, management of heritage, um, structures, culture, ecology, and looking at how it is that the public participation, knowledge and in, um, understanding, and even financial aspects can be integrated. So with that, within that established CZMU, they have developed direct policies to address it, and they have um, been very successful. I didn't get you. I'm saying that Barbados, they have a coastal zone management unit, and they have developed okay. policy frameworks okay. to address things like standards, procedures, okay. linkages, and public participation, financial sustainability. And that, in my opinion, is one place where coastal zone management has been a success. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, there's still so many questions, but uh, uh, these quick questions to um, Linda and Philip. Uh, can you say if Guyana generates any income from the mangroves through ecotourism as countries like Barbados, where tourists can do trade work, trade works through mangrove? If not, do you think this is an area we can develop? Thank you for that question. Uh, Pardon? Guyana, we attempt to engage in activities that are related to ecotourism, but the framework is not well defined and um, it's not well streamlined. Activities are not well streamlined. What I do know is that through the mangrove project, uh, very small sums are garnered from the activities that are undertaken, especially in those areas where we have the reserves. Um, so in my view, a lot more needs to be done in order to step up all aspects of ecotourism in development in this country, especially along the coast, because we have a lot of uh, biological diversity out here that can help to promote ecotourism drive along the coast. And I mentioned earlier in my, pr uh, in my presentation about Shell Beach, where we have the four species of turtles that nest there at different times of the years and so forth. We also have a variety of fa other fauna, as well as you know, our mangroves that facilitate visits, you know, research and those kinds of activities. So in my view, I believe that there is uh, a lot to be obtained financially from ecotourism development along our coast, but activities have to be streamlined properly. Thank you. Uh, still so many questions that are yet unanswered. Helen, this question is for you from Andrew Mesga. He said, um, how effective has online participations uh, been since the COVID pandemic for communities, particularly for vulnerable groups? And what systems need to be in place to ensure all communities and groups are involved in participation? Yeah, I mean that really does hit the nail on the head. Unfortunately, that one of the one of the downsides of moving a project online, uh, moving an engagement project online, is that you undoubtedly lose 
a sector of the of the population of the community. Now, I mean, on, on some levels, what's worked really weirdly in our project is that by going online, we have actually accessed a, a group that we wouldn't have accessed, um, but then lost another group. So it, we're not we're no further forward. We just happen to have kind of shifted shifted groups. Um, now, there's definitely a challenge in terms of connecting with those, um, you know, kind of whether it's minority groups or vulnerable people or just, a, you know, the, the communities that fundamentally don't want to get involved in things. Then I think that's a real challenge for a lot of a lot of us. And we what's been quite weird in what we have done is that we have actually because there's a lot of issues about when you're moving online to, you know, you're only dealing with people who are online themselves. And obviously there's a lot of people that don't have access to the internet or, or choose to not be involved in internet-based kind of activities. And by having that one week where we actually had an exhibition in the, the high street of the local town meant that we actually connected to a number of people who do not have an online presence. And we have maintained that connection um, through the months, um, whether that's in terms of just um, having kind of leaflets or um, meeting with people socially distanced in, in the high street. Um, so we, we've, we've managed to kind of sustain an element of connection to those people that aren't online. But I mean, I think if, we, if, if our lockdown um, persisted for much longer than we would, I mean, we're, we're already starting to think about what we can do over the summer to open up the access to the information, open up the engagement much more broadly because we will be able to go outside and meet with people in a socially distanced way again. And that is gonna make a substantial difference because doing it all online, whilst it has worked on some levels for some communities, yes, you do lose those other communities that fundamentally don't access material online. And I don't know what the answer exactly. to that is to be honest. Okay, thank you very much because the time is fast spent. It's, it's reaching midnight over there in uh, Indonesia now. <laughs> so um, I will ask two more questions, but other questions here. Uh, after the, these two short questions, I think um, uh, the panelists are invited to come and wrap up. Uh, 30, 30 seconds each. But now this question is for, is there, is there any consideration for integrating management of marine invasive species in the overall, overall management of the marine space. Uh, Philip, Linda, do you know of anything about this? No, I am not aware of, um, of that. All I know is that Guyana has been working quite a bit on marine invasive species. That's a particular um, work work um, project and the Environmental Protection Agency has been spearheading quite a bit of work in that regard. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, it's an area that the person also noticed that we need to, uh, is being understudied and I think we need to pay attention to that too. So um, another last question before we invite you to, um, uh, this mm -hmm. question, he said, will you say that community involvement is also a form of empowerment that contributes to the longevity of projects as well as their success? So if you can quickly talk about this, and then if you get, if panelists can help me type some of the answers to some of the questions uh, that you have access to, um, that would be nice because we just need to wrap up in the next few minutes. So, but can you answer that question? Will you say that community involvement it's also a form of empowerment that contributes to the longevity um, of projects as well as their successes. Uh, Linda? Yes, thank you for that uh, question. Yes, it's a very important question. And so community involvement is one of the main ideas that we have been running with for the past uh, years because it has been recognized that many of our projects our activities, initiatives that um, have been proposed and implemented have failed because we have not integrated fully various cohorts of members of the society, especially in the local community. And so community mobilization is critical 
but it also involves training and um, awareness. Because in order for persons to be empowered, they need to know. They need to know what to do, how to respond to situations, how to collect data, how to do a whole host of other things that are related to the management of resources, whether it's coastal or marine resources. Community involvement also is also critical because uh, we are part of the problem. The local community members are part of the problem and therefore they should be a part of the solution. So in order for that to happen, we have to ensure that we equip them with the necessary skills, the tools and the equipment for them to effectively carry out the work that we entrust in them. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've exhausted our time, but um, before we wrap up, um, there's, there's still a couple of questions that I we appreciate the panelists that, that will not be talking to help us quickly answer. But in wrapping up, I just want to give you maybe 10, 15 seconds uh, to conclude, I mean, your view as a panelist and uh, um, to provide a kind of a, a brief summary of what you would like uh, the, our participants to take away in this discussion. I will start from um, uh, Mr. Da Silva. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Bean. What I would like to say is that um, when, we look, when I look back at the entire activity that uh, we engage in today, there were so many synergies um, there, but the key aspect to me that stood out was the part of community involvement and community participation. It is something that within the mangrove project that was important. It is something that within coastal management that is very important. And when one looks at the, the two aspects, you cannot do it because as I mentioned, you're managing the coastal space for the people, you're managing the coastal space for the resources within, and therefore, how do you then leave the people out of the whole management process? So to me, community management, whether we call it participation, co-management, or what, whatever term we use, to me, that is so important. And that is a message that I would like for participants to take away today. Thank you Thank very you. much. So, but please, there's still some questions for you to answer. Please let me type response to that, right? Um, okay. Linda. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. And so the takeaway from today's session um, is that management actions, management actions that are related to coastal and marine resources management ought to be practical, um, reflecting on you know, the socioeconomic systems, the regulatory systems, the biophysical conditions that exist in the particular localities. And so, um, in my view, they must also simultaneously respect the principles of conservation. It is important because it's one thing to be exploiting the resources that are in these spaces for our livelihoods, but it's also another thing to destroy the very environment from which we extract the resources. So we need to ensure that we balance those um, activities and include some of the conservation principles. We also need to factor in that in marine and coastal management, it's not just about the jurisdiction, the local jurisdiction that you're controlling. You have to consider other areas that are in proximity to the particular location in which the management initiative is um, being undertaken. And so in my view, there is need for a better understanding of the processes that are going on at the shoreline zone, the marine area, you know, we need to engage in more research, especially in the areas of coastal processing and the mangrove management, because we have cited the case, Mr. De Silva has cited the case with the mangrove project that we, we have unfolding. But one of the major issues affecting that project is erosion occurring along the coastline. So we need a lot more research to be done 
in coastal studies, um, in mangrove management, but all is not lost. All is not lost. I believe that the problems and challenges and the issues that we have uh, identified this morning are surmountable, you know, with efficient and effective planning, as well as management and monitoring of the use of the resources and so forth. Uh, situations can be improved, okay? And so finally, I just want to note that uh, it is imperative to facilitate opportunities for increasing the number of specialists who are required to assist with data collection and conducting the research for coastal and marine management. Um, I'm particularly interested in what is going on in the marine zone, as we are aware there is a heightened interest in the utilization of the marine space. We have our oil and gas operations going on there and so forth. And so a lot of uh, work has to be put into that area, but if we do not have the specialists to do the work, we don't have the specialists to do the work, the hydraulic engineers and the sedimentologists and a whole range of other persons who are expected to find creative ways you know, for managing the zones, then, uh, you know, we, we are not going to be moving ahead with management, effective and efficient management of our coastal zones. So I'm particularly uh, happy that we've had the session this morning and um, a lot has been learned, at least from my perspective on what is happening in other jurisdiction based on what Professor uh, Burning Hammer had presented and uh, I'm looking forward to another presentation session where other coastal and marine issues, management issues and other things can be discussed. So thank you once again. Um, thank you so much, Linda. Linda, um, there's still some questions for you. Um, please, you can help me type your response to them before we finish. Uh, before I ask uh, Ellen for our own final thought, Please, all our participants that are here, kindly try to um, fill, um, uh, there's a link that has been provided here. Please supply your details as, I mean, just mark attendance and then to let us know your view. Uh, Helen, your thoughts, um, few seconds. Yeah, um, so I think, yeah, it's been quite interesting how there are some commonalities in, in, in our experiences despite the fact we are talking about quite different um, types of coastal systems and parts of the world. Um, and I think what Linda was saying is that, you know, we, we cannot do management without involving communities. I mean, it's just silly to think that that's even a possibility. Um, it's just not possible to do, to do these things separate to communities anymore. Um, and I think the other thing that we perhaps need to, to pick up on, on a bit more is just getting, getting people to understand and recognize that the place has changed, that environments change. And to, I think it's a, it's a bit of a struggle for a lot of people to really understand what change is, is a natural process and a natural dynamic that isn't necessarily gonna cause a significant problem in the long term relative to change that is a problem and is perhaps caused by us and therefore needs, needs to be mitigated and dealt with in, a, in, in some way. So I think there's, a, there's an education there still to kind of be, to, to benefit the wider population in terms of understanding the nature of change in coastal systems. Um, and that, that will then lead to kind of a more informed, kind of better, um, better understanding of, within that kind of broader um, engagement, uh, in, a broader range of people engaged in the process. Um, so yeah, I think key thing is communities have to be involved because they are part of the coastal system and, and we need to do a better job, I think, of, of recognising and um, demonstrating what, what change is within coastal systems. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, before we wrap up, um, I would like to ask um, my predecessor and um, Dr. Colette Bino, who uh, first of all facilitated my uh, engagement with AIS and who has always been supportive of what we, uh, we came up with, uh, especially particularly by this webinar and the panel discussion. So, Dr. Bino, over to you for the closing remarks. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator and the Program Chair, Dr. Timitope Oyedetun, for your graceful introduction. Esteemed members of the panel, Dr. Helen Burningham, Mr. Philip De Silva, and Ms. Linda Johnson Bola, our very special guest, Professor Paloma Mohamed Martin, the 11th Vice Chancellor of the University of Guyana. Mr. Ahmad Sani of the Archipelagic Islands Forum that we refer to as the AIS, special invitees, distinguished colleagues of the University of Guyana, our beloved students. A very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I have the good pleasure of being asked to give the vote of thanks for what can only be described as a very positive and fruitful online event. On behalf of the organizers, the AIS, and the University of Guyana, I wish to express deep gratitude to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Paloma Mohamed Martin, for taking time off of her very busy schedule, and not only blessing us with her presence, but also delivering some very inspiring remarks. To the esteemed members of the panel, Dr. Helen Birmingham, Burningham, sorry, Mr. Philip De Silva and Ms. Linda Johnson Bola. Many thanks for sharing your expertise and experience and for being very engaging in such fruitful, constructive and open exchanges on a very important and timely issue. I can assure you that we are now much more informed about issues of and innovative approaches to coastal and marine management. Chair, an event like this could not happen overnight. It requires careful planning. I wish therefore to express our deep sense of appreciation to our most dedicated and motivated colleagues, including Mr. Ahmad and Ms. Levita Sumali as well as their committed team. I must also express special thanks to our moderator and program chair, Dr. Timitope Oyedetun. You've done a fabulous job. To the staff of the Faculty of Earth and Environmental Sciences and the Department of Events, Conferences and Communication, thank you so very much for publicizing the events. Last but not least, to all participants, many thanks for gracing us with your presence and for being very engaging during the discussions. Once again, many thanks to everyone. May you continue to be safe and well. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Bino. And I want to, again, echo um, our thanks to everyone for making uh, this event a, a great success. Um, I want to close this uh, webinar. But before doing that, if you, if you permit me, do you, uh, if you don't mind, I would like um, Levita, who has been behind the scene doing most of the runs, to, to say thank you. Uh, or you want to just... You are typing it, All right? Anyway, uh, Levita, thank you so much. Um, and every participant, we are sincerely grateful for your presence today. And, um, but please take note, this is just the first of several series. Um, and uh, there will be some other series. May not be hosted by University of Guyana, maybe by another university within AIS, AIS countries, but please try to be part of it. All the panelists, thank you. Our Vice Chancellor, thank you and uh, have uh, a peaceful and restful week. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.